Okay, so welcome uh, everyone. So today it's my pleasure to uh, welcome back actually uh, Lyudmila Grigorieva, and then here she will be talking about uh, reservoir canals and Volterra series. Yeah, thank you, Lyudmila. Okay, hello everyone. That's a great pleasure to see that uh, we are numerous. And again, to be part of this series, because I remember Bumidian, you invited me sometime. I think it was like around one year and a half ago when I gave a uh, talk. So uh, it's nice to be here again and uh, great pleasure. Thank you for having me here and uh, thank you for all for joining. So today we'll be talking about uh, Reservoir Kernels and Volterra series. This is a paper which is uh, co-authored with Lucas Gonu, uh, who now just recently in fall joined Imperial College London and Juan Pablo Ortega, who uh, is at NTU Singapore. So Lucas told me that perhaps he will be able to make it for the talk, but Juan Pablo, I did not count on that because of the time zone differences. But anyways, um, it would be great uh, to be able to pass them the feedback about this work. So we pub we posted uh, recently, like in mid-December paper with the same title, Reservoir Kernels and Volterra Series. So you can find it in archive. And if you're interested to get a more detailed read, please go ahead and we will be very happy about that. So let me give you an outline of the talk. Uh, so I will be talking about uh, reservoir kernel Hilbert spaces and learning. Then I will put it in perspective with reservoir computing. This is like a broad field we are working uh, um, on uh, us and people around us and many people who joined now today this talk also work uh, a lot in this area. And then I will be trying to set up um, a scene where we can define the so-called reservoir kernels of Volterra series. So for that, I will need to introduce Volterra series representation. And this will be based on the work that we um, also recently published, uh, three of us in co-authorship with uh, Krista Cucchiero from, from Vienna and Josef Teichmann from ETH. And you can also find that paper online. And I will be talking about universality of kernels in this setting. And also I will hope to make it to the numerical illustration where my goal is to convince you that actually in empirical applications, these kernels do a great job in comparison to others that are available in the literature, in particular data science applications. So let me start from some motivation why we care about reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. And uh, I believe that Boumediene would be a much a, a better expert in this topic. But let me just briefly outline that reproducing kernels and reproducing curl, kernel Hilbert spaces, uh, RKHS abbreviated, are um, well a very well known and um, a powerful embedding um, group of methods, which is used a lot in machine learning or more generally statistical learning and has beautiful theoretical properties and also excellent empirical results in various, various settings. In particular, they're known to um, work extremely well in applications which have to do with static learning. So everything that has to do with static classification, regression, pattern recognition, other learning settings, this is the playground where these are KHS and kernel tricks. Um, they are very known to perform extremely well and produce beautiful results. So what is the main advantage which goes with these RKHS and kernel approaches is the fact that you can use the so-called represent a theorem, which I don't stop uh, much in detail, but what this represent a theorem actually allows you to do is for a generic loss and the target function potentially penalized, uh, you can reduce this nonlinear complex learning problem uh, to just estimation of coefficients in your linear regression. So this, of course, is a very strong tool, which is massively used uh, in various applications. And this will be basically a tool of choice or RKHS will be a um, group of methods uh, based on our RKHS techniques that we will be trying to put in connection with a reservoir computing models and approaches which have to do with that. So let me now tell you what are other uh, similar ideas that are circulating around in the setting of dynamic learning tasks. So as I said, usually in RKHS um, kernel techniques, usually what one is doing, even if you are facing a dynamic learning task, you are recasting it into a static one. We're basically having, let's say, a time series of your 
um, of your observations, let's say of a dy dynamical system or, or realization of your stochastic process, you're just handling it as a nan long, let's say, sample of points. And then you're trying to find a solution uh, as basically a, um, uh, which happens to be in the span of this data. So you are searching for, let's say, n coefficients of your um, uh, linear regression problem uh, due to the representative theorem. And actually, this is how you find um, the solution of your nonlinear original learning problem of question. So what do we do in the context of dynamic learning tasks? So in the field of reservoir computing, we're trying to take a different approach. We're not recasting a problem, a dynamic problem into a static one. But what one is usually doing, you are trying to approximate um, a sane nonlinear I.O. system using randomly generated state space systems. And the core advantage, and now you can see the link already with the RKHS, is that only linear readout is usually estimated. So again, the same idea is exploited. One is trying to solve a nonlinear um, complex learning problem using um, just linear regression. So we have uh, worked quite a bit trying to prove universality in different uh, contexts, in different settings. So there is a whole series of works by myself, Juan Pablo, Lucas, and people around us. Um, this is not the, the topic that I will be mostly talking about uh, in this presentation, but I will come back to this universality or its strong version a bit later when I will be talking about uh, reservoir kernels. So the connections to the RKHS idea is, of course, um, right in the air. We're trying to do ultimately the same inputs are non-linearly embedded or represented in the state space, and then we're linearly reading them out. Well, there are obviously connections to other concepts. One could think about classical embedding strategies, a la Takens. One could think of generalized synchronizations. One could think about signatures in the rough path theory, because there we know that there is this beautiful mathematical result that, let's say, on compact sets of non-tree-like uh, paths, um, so any continuous uh, path functional can be uniformly approximated by linear function of the signature, right? Which the signature is ultimately iterated uh, integrals of the path with itself. So the same idea that you can linearly read out the signature representation of a path, then you need to estimate only those coefficients and you are getting basically your approximate, um, which is estimable and which can be hence applied in different learning uh, applications. So these ideas, they are united by similar, let's say, intuition and similar, let's say, inspiration. And this is what we will be talking about here. So let me just remind for those of you who are not familiar with reservoir computing, what we mean by that. So we're usually meaning as reservoir computing systems, state-space systems of this type that you see on the slide, where what we are doing, we're ultimately transforming the input sequences, so these will be elements in the input sequence spaces into sequences as elements in the output sequence spaces. So here you have the Z, Z and Y, Z to refer to denote those uh, with the help of the so-called state map F, capital F, we will use it a lot in the talk, and the readout H little h. So we are calling these systems, so we're basically using a notation where we use this triple usually, where x will uh, be denoting for us the state space, f, I remind you, state map or reservoir map, and h will be readout map. So with this kind of a notation, we need to specify um, what do we mean actually by reservoir computing state, state space systems, because of course this class of systems is quite broad. So what do we mean by RC, uh, let's say family that belongs to the large family of various nonlinear state space systems of this kind? What we usually require will be, what we usually use in our talks will be something of a picture that you see from the left hand side, we have this input layer or our sequences in our that come in into the, if you want an um, analogy with a recurrent neural network come in. Um, these elements in the input sequence space come in, then they're transformed by this 
um, state map or reservoir map F, which in the recurrent neural network will be defined by, a, for example, some activation function acting element wise and some connectivity matrix of uh, the, um, the internal connectivity matrix of the internal weights in your recurrent neural network. And then it is read out by our map H to obtain the um, output layer or outputs as sequences in the output sequence space. So this F, what we require is that it is or its ingredients, um, for example, randomly sampled. So in the case of random neural network, this would be internal weights of a regular neural network that are not subjected to training. So they are randomly sampled or drawn out of some law and then left for good for the whole phase. So you are sampling them and you are never touching them again. You are never re-estimating. And it's only the readout, potentially linear, map that is subject to training or estimation. So this would be what we would call the reservoir computing state space systems. So one of the examples that I need to showcase is that if you are not coming from reservoir computing field and you have not ever heard about, uh, you, you have at some point heard about reservoir computing, perhaps that would be an example of a representative of this RC family that you have seen. And this is so-called eco-state network. So this is a close relative of recurrent neural network, very similar to the one that I showed in the previous slide, where you have an activation function that acts element-wise in, let's say, Jaeger's result and the eco-state networks. Um, usually, that would be some nonlinear activation function that is used, but not necessarily. And then you have the A, which is so-called reservoir matrix or connectivity matrix C that allows to embed inputs into the state space. And then you have this um, possibly bias, which is present in the state equation. What one needs to take into account is that all these A, C, and Z will be randomly sampled out of some law. And then it is only the readout map here in this case, just a matrix W that needs to be estimated. And clearly that would be given by the solution of, for example, linear regression potentially penalized. So it could be a rich regression solution that gives you the W. So with that in mind, what we are trying to do now is uh, to use some hypothesis. So what kind of, uh, let's say, um, ingredients we need for our further on results. So our usual hypothesis we work with in this literature and under which the majority of res results um, has been obtained, sometimes without FMP, but um, I would say that the majority of results are obtained under both these conditions. So we would require the so-called ESP, Ecostate property. This is the abbreviation that we will be acronym that we will be using throughout the talk, uh, which basically means that we will require the existence and uniqueness of solution of our state space system as a whole, or, or just the state equation in particular, which means that for any input in the input sequence space, there exists a unique output sequence right in the sequence space, such that both those equations that I gave you in the beginning um, defining the state space system hold. And in, under this condition, we can also define the state space filter. This is something that we will use in further on slides, the so-called U, where F and H stand for the state map and readout map, and we will sometimes drop them or not, depending on the setting. And of course, um, this filter is given such that the image of this filter will be exactly the output of our system and they are linked by ESP. One more assumption that we will use mostly will be so-called FMP. I'm not stopping about the technical definition of this, but what this means is that we will work with filters for which the inputs, roughly speaking, in the far past do not count. What we need to know is that filters under these uh, assumptions, filters are causal and time invariant. And then what we can do, we can also associate to these filters one more particularly interesting and useful object, which is so-called functional, which just eats up sequences, let's say um, left infinite sequences in the input space, and it spits the elements in the out, uh, output space, which is not a sequence anymore, but for example, these could be elements in Euclidean M-dimensional space. And then of course, the functional can be defined uh, using the filter according to this assignment. Okay, so with that, we will be working with filters and functionals whenever it's convenient to use one or another under ESP and FMP conditions. So let me now tell you about some work that has been done before 
Already in previous works, we were asked by referees to, um, let's say, provide some rationale of working with uh, a particular type of systems that we had in the, this publication in the Journal of um, Geometric Mechanics, where we were worrying about canon uh, canonicalization and, uh, and let's say reduction in that setting. And we were asked by referees to talk about why this, let's say, reduction makes sense, in particular in learning. And this is when we came up with this result that will be used now by us in what follows. So what we did there, we managed to associate a reproducing kernel Hilbert space to the state space system with a state map F. This is our usual notation that eats up elements in this product space of state space X and input uh, space Z and uh, gives you again elements in the state space X with equal state uh, property using as a feature map, nothing else but the functional which is associated to this state map which has ESP. So using this HF as a feature map, we were able to construct a kernel, and then we were able to construct, hence, um, the reproducing kernel Hilbert space induced by this kernel. So what was an advantage of that kind of a work is that using the represent a theorem, then later on, we also managed to reduce the search from searching a linear readout uh, as an element in the potentially very large state space X uh, to a search on a, basically on a domain which is much smaller and which is the so-called uh, XR bar, which is nothing else but the linear span of the so-called reachable states of the reservoir. So what are these reachable states? This XR, uh, this is a set of basically images of our inputs under our functional associated to the state map. So this XR bar obviously can be much smaller than the state space. Let's say we are working in finite dimensional case and we are working with number of neurons, which is a few thousands. Uh, if the reachable sets uh, uh, basically happens to be, or span of reachable states happens to be much smaller, we are winning by a lot. And it could be, well, much more dimension reduced, our problem of optimization. And we were calling it implicit reduction. We will see that this dimensionality reduction is especially important whenever we will be working with state space, which happens to be infinite dimensional. Because even in the finite dimensional space, there is a big gain or there can be a big gain. But in infinite dimensional case, of course, this kind of implicit reduction is something that we would hunt for. So let me now set up the scene. What do we call uh, kernels and how we define them in this setting? So again, we are working under the same assumptions. I'm again working with state map, which is such that uh, is defined for state space, which happens to be itself a Hilbert space, which is not a big deal, obviously, right? This is what we usually have. And F has ESP. So we do have the existence and uniqueness of solutions of the state equation, which is defined using F. And hence, we have an associated function, right, HF. How do we define this reservoir kernel? Reservoir kernel will be a map, and I already told you that we will be using this HF as a feature map, which will be doing nothing else but taking elements in the product space of two left infinite sequence spaces, so Z and Z prime, and will be mapping them into a Nina product of the images of the Z and Z prime under this functional in my Hilbert space X. So what is cute about this is that whenever I know what the HF is, this kernel is computable, I can clearly compute it. And then we can say that for a general case, whenever even you have no chance to compute these objects, we still know that, uh, well, a kernel defined like that happens to be symmetric, positive semi-definite, and hence falls under this Mercer uh, theorem um, requirement, and hence allows us to construct an RKHS, which is induced by this kernel, which we can do as follows. So we are using the straight H as usual, and we are talking here about the corresponding RKHS to this kernel, reservoir kernel, which is given by now the closure of this span or finite linear combinations of elements of KZ type 
or if you want, I can say that this will be a span of uh, uh, kernel functions, right? And obviously, this is an infinite dimensional object. And uh, only for particular cases when our x happens to be finite dimensional, so when our state space happens to be finite dimensional, we have finitely many uh, neurons, well, the structure of this Hilbert space becomes quite uh, easy to characterize, and um, there are no complications which are associated to it, which we will see come when x is infinite dimensional. So let me now go further. And I will tell you how now, if I have this kernel, we can use the kernel trick in a standard fashion. So if I have a chance to get to be able to write down this um, well functional, which is associated to my um, to my uh, state map, and I will be able to compute this in a product, and hence I can use my kernel trick in full glory. How will I do that? Well, using the same strategy as one would follow solving the learning problem using the representative theorem and a finite sample of training observations. Let me give you a state map again, satisfy CSP. I'm giving you a finite training sample of n points. These are pairs of my inputs and target variables. Here I'm just keeping the one dimensional targets, but obviously it could be generalized for m-dimensional case. And what we're doing, we're trying to address now the, the difficulty that these z's are infinite, left infinite uh, sequences. So how we are going about that, we are constructing the so-called truncated input uh, samples, where what we are doing for every i from 0 up to n minus 1, we will be keeping only up to minus n plus 1 input points that are not 0, but we will be zeroing out all the other one up to minus infinity. And this way we will be computing this or defining these truncated input samples and we will, be, we will be having n of them. And now we can define empirical risk in a standard fashion. So empirical risk, which is associated to the loss up to a modeler to define for the system that is characterized by this functional associate to the state map and my linear readout W, so this is for a particular case of a linear map as a readout H. Uh, I can define my empirical risk, which will be nothing else but the sample average of my loss that they commit uh, when I'm trying to um, achieve my target variable Y, uh, I from zero up to N minus one with my system or with my system or with my state uh, um, states a read out uh, by the linear readout map w and these states are nothing but images of my truncated samples under this um, functional associated to the state map right so i apply my state map functional to my truncated samples i'm obtaining states which are associated to it and then well i'm constructing just an inner product with my read uh, linear readout, right? So I'm doing just basically a projection. So now I give you one more ingredient I allow for penalty. So I will take some omega, which will be a strictly increasing function. And this way I can possibly go not for empirical risk minimization, but for regularized empirical risk minimization. And our goal is to find the minimizer of what you see of a type of three. So what we're trying to do, we are trying to find a function in my Hilbert space H, in my RKHS H, um, a minimizer of the penalized empirical risk where penalty is nothing else but this omega function. And this penalty is usually put on the norm in my Hilbert space of my function F. So once I find this minimizer, I have solved my empirical risk minimization in my RKHS. And my basically solution is there ready to be applied for whatever application purposes I'm addressing. Okay, so with this setting, what we can do, we can produce these two important results. One um, is dates back to this previous result that I showed you, where we were worrying about implicit re reduction. So what we say is that the regularized or pure ERM problem, empirical risk minimization problem, associated to my empirical risk RN hat, which I just spelled out earlier, admits the following different reformulations. So I can either search, as I showed you earlier, a minimizer in my RKHS, which is an infinite dimensional optimization problem, 
I could also search for a minimizer um, within the state space. And in the case when the state space happens to be finite dimensional, then this is already very nice because this is a finite dimensional optimization problem, unlike what we had uh, earlier. Um, however, even in the case when this X is finite dimensional, but of large dimension, we said that we can recast this problem into such where we are looking for a minimizer now in a smaller domain, which is the span of the reachable sets that I just explained earlier. And there is already a gain in doing this. And I told you that whenever this X happens to be infinite dimensional, when this equality is even more important for us, as we will see later. And, or otherwise I could just search, obviously not for any F in my RKHS, but this F happens to be um, functional, so which I associated to my state map or reservoir map and my readout W. And then, well, depending on the setting, this penalty is put either on the norm uh, in my Hilbert space, which is my state space, or in my Hilbert space, which is RKHS. So this is an implicit reduction. What we can take home from it is that already there is a good way to go to a simpler optimization problem. However, this XR, so this span of reachable states is usually extremely difficult to characterize. So for a general situation. So in terms of applications, there is not much that we can really gain out of this, um, unless we really know how to characterize the span, right? Which you know, I would say is not that easy to do. Another result that will be handy for us, which is so-called kernelization. So here we apply a kernel trick and we say that well, under these appropriate assumptions, this three, this general RKHS um, ERM problem um, actually has a solution which is given by the representative theorem as we're used to have in this kind of settings. So what kind of a solution we are getting? So a solution of um, an ERM pen penalized problem of a type in this formula three will be given by nothing else but this readout W hat which is a linear combination of images of our truncated samples under a functional which I associate to the state map. And once we have some knowledge about how these HF look like, so for example, their analytical expression, then obviously we will be able to write down this solution explicitly, provided that we know who those alphas are. And I would like to pay attention to the fact that this linear combination contains as many terms as the length of our training sample. So as many as we have points in our training sample that I earlier specified over here, right? So we had N long training samples of pairs of inputs and targets. And now we know that these alphas, well, they can be obtained, for example, using uh, Gremian. So one could recast this optimization problem uh, into um, optimization problem that is formulated in terms of the gram, gram matrix, where for every um, i and j from one up to n, we can construct an entry of our gram matrix as simply evaluating our kernel, we already defined it earlier, um, basically on these truncated samples. And here pay attention to the fact that this will go up to i and this will go up, uh, will start, up, this will start from j and this uh, i and this will start from j. And now we can recast our optimization problem into starting from the infinite dimensional one, possibly here finite dimensional, but maybe in the case of X, uh, infinite dimensional, still infinite dimensional, we can finally get to a finite dimensional. Sorry, you cannot see the end of the display of the formula, but this is, we're looking a minimizer now in N dimensional Euclidean space. So we're looking for minimizers, those alphas that guarantee the minimum of the panel penalized uh, ERM, which consists out of looking at the average of a loss that we're committing when we're um, trying to reach our target Y with a projected kernel with the help of alphas. And then possibly we can put on the penalty at the norm of this uh, ultimately projection, right? So now we have these tools in which we can basically hopefully set the scene and apply this, there is a big problem that goes with this. So let me start first potentially with uh, some remarks. So there are good things. I already told you that we can reduce um, our problem to a possibly dimensionally smaller problem because we will be working with a span of reachable states. I told you that this XR bar is very difficult problem to characterize. 
And then with the representative theorem, we saw that what is great is that the optimal solution happens to be in the span of the data. So we will have, well, our solution written down in terms of the, of the sample points, as many as we have, so n of them. So this is great. And then on top of that, the solution, if we are solving it already in n-dimensional Euclidean space, will render, the, this solution will be such that it will be actually um, uh, taking place in the, uh, in the uh, span of reachable sets without the need to compute them, right? So we're killing basically two birds uh, with one stone. So this is a great uh, way to approach it. And then the kernel trick is obviously computationally relevant when the dimension, for example, of the state space is much larger than the number of the training points that we have in our sample. So let's say that we are working with 10,000 dimensional state space, but we have little n, which is equal to 1,000. So obviously in that case, going for this kind of a problem optimization representation is much better choice. So what are the difficulties? The difficulties are right there. If you're looking at the formulation, well, we need to know what this kernel is. And for that, unfortunately, we need to know what the functional associate to our state map is. And the problem is that even for the eco-state network that I showed case you as a one of the representatives of these reservoir computing um, systems, um, well, it, it is the case that you cannot explicitly or analytically write down what the HF is. So for linear systems, of course, it is possible, but as soon as your activation function is nonlinear, then there is, well, little chance to get explicit um, way of writing this HF, and hence you will not be able to compute your kernel, and hence you will not be able to compute your gramian and solve this problem in this kind of a representation, and hence you to get your W hat as the linear combination using those alphas as coefficients. So that's a big problem. And moreover, something that is also important is that even if you work with universal reservoir families, so proved uh, in different settings, uh, in deterministic, stochastic, uh, so we prove that different uh, reservoir families happen to be universal within, let's say, fading memory filters category, um, or without that assumptions, for example, Juan Pablo has the paper with Lucas when they drop the FMP assumption, but all these university uh, results that actually they do not get inherited by the kernel. So unfortunately, even if I work with a reservoir such that the, it happens to be universal and I construct the functional which is associated to its state map, whenever I'm constructing the kernel, there is no guarantee that the kernel itself will be universal. So in what sense universal? I will spell it out um, a little bit later, but uh, this is what we are trying to um, um, set up as our goal. What we want is to construct a reservoir kernel that will first, it allows to approximate any costal time invariant fading memory functional. Second, it is efficiently computable. So for example, I can use what I just spelled out in this kernelization part. Um, and then I can compute this kernel and I can estimate my alphas and I can use them to get my readout W and then further on use it for forecasting or for, for any kind of regression or classification tasks, both in static and in dynamic setting. And obviously I would like to get it so that it's online updatable because we want to work with time series and forecasting or path continuation and nothing like that is available. So out of the sequential kernels that are out there, like for example, all these uh, GAC kernels or signature kernels or PDE signature kernels. So within this family of sequential kernels, there are none that actually allow you to online update the kernel value as a function of the previous value in time. So this is what we would like to have because we have this recursive nature of our state space system. So can we inherit that kind of a structure for our kernels as well? And moreover, we would like to construct a reservoir kernel that happens to be universal by construction, right? So we would like to put this kind of safeguards for ourselves. Can we do that? And it turns out that we could get an inspiration from our previous work uh, which is based on the so-called Volterra series representation. So here I would like to make a little bit step back and to tell you that there is a, this paper, which I already mentioned, co-authored by three of us and uh, Krista Kukiero and Josef Teichmann, 
where what we were trying to do, we were trying to put some kind of a relation between reservoir computing field or area of research or models uh, with signature uh, representations of paths. And there we could see that we could somehow um, recognize that reservoir computing models in some particular cases happen to be well, brothers, if you want, um, or very similar to the signature representation of paths, uh, which are linearly read out um, in this kind of a literature. And then we were calling it randomized uh, signature representation. And there would be ways how you can using the Johnson Linden Strauss lemma, uh, get that insight. But what was important there was this initial um, basically intuition that we had is that if you're working with a causal time invariant fading memory filter, so this is not restrictive, you are in nature, we're working with these filters a lot, it admits the so-called Volterra series representation. This is a very old result, I will now show it to you. And people spend some time trying to, let's say, find ways in which they can estimate coefficients in that representation. So think of a Taylor series expansion, for example, and think of estimating coefficients in that representation, the same type of, uh, let's say, tasks uh, people were facing in this research. And this was done by also kernel-based techniques or by neural approaches. There was a massive, uh, let's say, study on that. What we were trying to do is to use this Volterra series representation to get something different, which I will now um, more in detail explain. So what we are hoping for is that if we're getting this Volterra series representation, not approximation, we would hope that we would be able to construct our KHS as feature maps, let's say using the truncated representation. So using some orders, uh, so let's say taking in this representation, let's say the, 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 uh, up to the order, let's say P uh, and up to the order L, both in time and in terms of the order, of, uh, of those uh, elements in my representation. Um, and we would hope to construct a kernel using those, and then to obviously construct them um, induced by it, uh, uh, representing, uh, uh, representing kernel Hilbert spaces. And then obviously to use that further on our work, but it doesn't work so easily. Why is that the case? Well, because in the FMP setting, we need to determine this higher, order, highest order in our this, uh, expansion, and also to determine degree of time lag truncation. So what happens is that basically you are pretty quickly, if you want to set up the recursion in terms of your kernel, you're quickly leaving the family of your kernel the way you defined it because of these truncation problems. Instead, what we decided to do, and in part it was inspired by this uh, Salvi Lyons and uh, Cothers paper on PDE signature kernels, is to go infinite dimensional. So before I go to that, let me provide you a few ingredients of what will be needed for, uh, further. We are working always with uniformly bounded inputs and outputs. So this KM and KL will stand for domains for our inputs and outputs. So this is basically we're taking elements in our left init sequence space with elements uh, defined on d-dimensional Euclidean space for inputs and m-dimensional without loss of generality um, Euclidean space for outputs. And then um, we are just making sure that all these elements uh, in this uh, left infinite sequence spaces, they are um, finite norm, right? And well, basically we are making sure that we are keeping a track of this M and L because that will be needed for us in order to set up basically the or or to, to uh, whenever we will be talking about the existence and uniqueness of solutions which are, which uh, um, are uh, eating up those inputs as these right so then what we will have for one more part of our let's say story will be filter so we are taking a causal time invariant FNP filter, say U, that eats up inputs in KM, and it takes you to output KL. And what we require is some kind of standard things uh, in this, uh, um, sorry, I went too far. We require that at zero, this filter takes zero value. And then, well, the standard thing that the restriction to a ball is analytic as a map between 
these Banach spaces uh, whose subsets KM and KL are respectively. So with those ingredients, now I can give you this Volterra representation result, which is not new, again, I emphasize, um, but we just um, generalized it for um, infinite sequences, which just tells you that for inputs of a type that I just showed you, and this generic causal time invariant fading memory filter U, there will exist a Volterra series representation of this form. There is too much text here. Let me just concentrate on this expression. What we mean by that is that, as you can see, we will have uh, infinite sums. So either sums that um, uh, go to infinity or start at minus infinity, where we will have these monomials, which are written down in terms of our inputs, these, right? We will have J order monomials, where order of these monomials is anything from one up to infinity. And then, well, clearly, we will have also to keep a track of time, and this um, tracking uh, time will also allow us to go up to minus infinity for any of these uh, monomial uh, components, as you can see over here. And what we notice also is that this representation, as this infinite sum representation, it has these coefficients, which are the only thing that are specific to a filter that we're trying to approximate, because these monomials will be common for any filter I'm trying to represent. And it's only this GI, these maps with J from one to infinity that will be subject to tuning, right? So they will be filter dependent. This coefficients is nothing else but the J's power um, or, or if you want the J's the fresh derivatives of a functional which is associated to this filter, evaluated at zero. And it will be up to us to get an idea who those coefficients are if we are trying to um, come up with this, uh, let's say, faithful representation for a, for a given filter U. What we did in previous works, we were trying to truncate these sums. We would come up with a truncated representation, truncated representation which happens to be approximation now of this U. And we were trying to come up with a state space system whose solutions happen to be when they're linearly read out, give you exactly the filter. Can we play the same game here? So keeping the fact that these monomials are the same for whatever filter we are trying to approximate, and it's only these GJ's maps that are specific to a filter in question, can we play the same game? Well, can we come up with a state space system um, such that its solutions will give us exactly when they're linearly read out gives us exactly this representation U. So let's see what is the motivation for us. So exactly what I told you, what we would like to have is a state equation that will involve only inputs because they're filter independent. And then only with a readout map, we will be reading out those states from our state space system. And we are hoping that in that case, we will be getting the U um, according to this Volterra series representation. So what happens is in the case when you are truncating, you actually will be coming up with the approximant. So you will be able only to approximate this U linearly reading out from that state space system with finite dimensional state space. However, if we now just detour and we decide that we will not truncate and we will allow for a state space system to have a state space which is infinite dimensional, then all of a sudden it happens that we will be able to construct a linear readout of such a state space system or state equation, um, which lives in the infinite dimensional space that it will be giving us exactly the representation of our filter in question. So not any more approximation, but the representation. So let us see how this goes, right? For that, we need a couple of objects. So first we need, of course, tensor space of order L on RD. That's not difficult to see because we will be working with these monomials. So construct it as a tensor product of these inputs. And then hence, we will need this tensor space of order L on RD. Next, what we will need also will be tensor algebra of RD, which is nothing else but the external direct sum of uh, basically our tensor spaces of all orders, sorry, in my mouse it just jumps, of all orders up to infinity. So this is a direct sum of all tensor spaces of all orders L. And uh, moreover, we will need one more thing. Uh, we will, since we're 
working with monomials of a particular order that we allow to go to infinity. And then we would like the time to go to minus infinity, according to the Volterra representation that I showed you in these infinite sums. We will need also to take a tensor of tensors, right? So that means that we will need to construct a tensor series, which we will denote by this T um, double RD, right? Which is a direct product of now this time around of our tensor spaces of all orders up to infinity. So if I would use, let's say, um, a neat representation using canonical basis, I can immediately write it down as you see over here, where this sum will be an external sum that goes to infinity and this sum up to D will be internal, which basically is inherited because of the RD, right? So this is for D dimensional inputs. And now this tensor algebra consists, obviously, this particular tensor algebra will consist of those uh, elements in my tensor series, which have finitely many non-zero coefficients, right? So my T, R, D um, will be nested in my tensor series. Okay, very good. So now what I need also to tell you is that other things are quite straightforward to understand is that we will have this inner product, which is just inherited um, from the inner product uh, for Euclidean space, R, D. And moreover, we will be able also to use this in a product that you see here. You can also write it down using canonical basis and RD. You can use it uh, in order to induce the norm on my tensor algebra, right? So in this case, what I can also do, I can also construct the completions, right? And I obtain, well, this T uh, bar RD will be nothing else but the Hilbert space of the series of the tensor of the series in my tensor series space, right, with finite norm, and moreover, I can play the same completion game um, using the norm and inner products that you saw over here twice, and I could construct the completion now of Hilbert space that is a completion of my T R D, and we will call it again. Uh, this way, I'm obviously getting a Hilbert space again of which we will be calling a double tensor algebra, and we will denote it by T2, or we will be keeping this double bar uh, notation. So now this double tensor algebra is double infinite object, right? In terms of the order of monomials and in terms of, let's say, lag structure that we will need for our state representation. And now with these objects in, in uh, game, what I need one more ingredient is, well, how can I, basically transform my inputs so that they live in my uh, Hilbert space T double parentheses RD or otherwise in my tensor series, right? How can I do that so that the Z is not anymore an element in RD but is an element, it's tra transformed version is an element in my tensor series? Well, basically um, tensor series space. What I can do, I can do the so-called tau ten tensorization. So I will come up with some hyperparameter tau, uh, a real, um, such that I can convert or transform my inputs, constructing the tensor product i times i will be running from one up to infinity, coming up with this product with tau in power i and adding one. And this z tilt will be such that first with appropriate choice of tau, um, it will have a finite norm and it will be uh, an element in my tensor series space. So now everybody can be infinite dimensional. So I can work with infinite dimensional state space and I have an infinite dimensional analog of my finite dimensional input. It's tau tensorized version Z tau, Z tilt. Okay, so with that, we need just to make sure that we keep a track of how large this tau can be, because this is what is used in order to guarantee the finiteness of a norm and later on the existence and uniqueness of our solutions for state equation, which obviously will fail if our tau is not such that this condition is satisfied. And I remind you that this Z um, norm is uh, um, given to us by this capital M that we had before when we were defining this K sub capital M, right? So basically this will be tau, squared and squared smaller than one, right? This will be the condition that we need to satisfy for the tau. Okay, so with that, now I can propose to you 
um, something that we got inspired from our previous work. But if you want, this is just a beautiful guess of a state equation that happens to be recursive, which happens to have all the properties that we can prove for it and which does all the job that we actually required. So let us take a look at how this equation looks like. So now again, for M, tau, appropriate cheat chosen, um, uh, and some another hyperparameter lambda that also needs to be appropriately chosen for the existence and uniqueness of solutions of my uh, recursive equation, I can provide you its form. So what it does, it just uh, basically constructs the tensor product of the tensorized version of my time t input with the lambda scaled um, state at the previous time step t minus one and I'm adding one. So this xt never leaves the t to rd, right? So for whatever t, we're closed uh, in the t to rd under this recursion. And then moreover, what is uh, nice is that I can say that this state equation has very nice properties. First, I can immediately say, as I said, under appropriate choice of lambda, which we took care of, the system will have an ESP, so it will have um, solution and it will be unique. It will, hence, since we have ESP, we'll be able to define a unique causal time invariant fading memory filter. We will keep this vault here to denote a Volterra parameterized by this lambda, which eats elements in my KM and spits states in my left infinite sequence of elements in my double tensor algebra. Right, so this is quite a nasty object, but the good thing is that I can even explicitly write down how it looks. And uh, well, this is something that will be handy for us in a minute. So I have now the filter, which is associated to XT. And what is important, thinking of my previous comments about the fact that this filter is not always um, e explicitly available and its analytical form is ready to use. Here we have an explicit expression for this kind of a state uh, equation. Moreover, this state equation, um, it's only inputs, so it does not depend on a filter that we're trying to approximate. And moreover, what is nice is that, well, I can linearly read out what I get out of this filter and I get exactly my filter that I was trying to approximate. So now we can see that this U Volterra will be absolutely universal, so strongly universal. It doesn't see the filter in question we're trying to represent. And then it's up to us to tune this W to get the filter in question, right? So Boumedien, I have only one hour or do I have a little bit more time? Yeah, this is the same format. There's no time limit. Yeah, we can talk. Okay, well. very good. So I will not try to, to do it too long, but uh, I just want to make a point. Okay, very good. So now with this uh, result, let me just spell out what we call, um, whom we call how, right? So we will be calling this uh, representation, we will be calling it Volterra fil filter representation of our FMP filter that we were basically trying to represent you. Then what we will say is that my U volt, the one that you have seen on the previous slide, which is explicitly available, we will call it Volterra filter. And then what is nice is that, well, actually, clearly we, we also can write down explicitly, <laughs> I should have done it earlier, the state map for such a state equation, and we will call it Volterra reservoir map, right? So this reservoir Volterra map just writes down what we had in the state equation, nothing else about that. We have this Volterra filter, I repeat, Volterra filter representation. And now it is only up to us to tune this W for a filter in question U, and we will get out of the same Volterra filter U volt lambda. Reading out with different Ws, we can represent different filters. So this is what we call strong universality. We have a collection, we have an object, this U volt lambda, that is handy for us to go. We can keep it in the pocket. And now we can reading it out with a properly chosen W. We can actually ensure that we are not only approximating a filter in question, some FMP causal time invariant object, but we can represent it. So, and this is due to this infinite dimension uh, structure that we preserved. We were not truncating anything, and hence we're getting a representation still holding.
Okay, and what I can also do, I can associate hands to this Volterra filter a functional the way we were used to do that uh, for any time invariant causal um, ESP filter, right? And we will call it H volt lambda. Okay, so now we have all these objects. What can I do with them? Well, first, this is just an observation that I just spelled out. If you want to represent another filter, let's say U prime, you'd better just choose another W prime, but all the other ingredients, for example, this state recursion, this state, uh, this Volterra filter, um, my Volterra map, of course, everything will be in place. So it's only up to tuning of a W that you are need to do in order to model a particular filter. Okay, so with that, I told you that uh, we're still maybe not there because I did not yet tell you how would I compute it, right? Uh, but we already know that this can be done in, on the level of filters. Can we now look back to the RKHS story and try to see whether, since we now have this Volterra functional explicitly available, now I can really compute it, which was a problem before, I can hence define my kernel and I can use my kernel trick and, well, use my representative theorem, which I was preaching about in the beginning. Okay, so before I do that, I need to also mention that there was one more goal that we were trying to obtain, not only to be able to explicitly write down the kernel, right, but also, or to make it computable, but we also tried uh, to get some universality results. And I told you that universality of a reservoir family or the family that goes with a particular state representation does not get propagated to the universality of a kernel when you are constructing using the functional associate to that state map, right? What happens is that, well, uh, what is beautiful is that if I define universality of a kernel using this definition, which is well why known in this universality kernel literature, so we are defining the space of kernel sections, which will consist of all the functions, um, well, C0, uh, with a domain of the left infinite uh, sequence space that we used already for our inputs, which are uniform limits of functions of the form where you're just constructing the linear combination of your kernel functions with some real coefficients, uh, we call the kernel K uh, universal if actually the space of kernel sections um, is actually all the C0, Z, Z minus functions, right? If this happens, then we can say that our kernel is universal. Can we get that for our kernel? Well, indeed, that's the case. We can show that our Volterra reservoir kernel is universal. So we can actually show that the definition holds for this particular construction of a Volterra kernel when we define it using the Volterra functional, right? So when we are defining it using this H volt lambda. I will not stop on that uh, result in detail, but we were very happy of getting it because this actually means that you can now be on the safe side and actually guarantee that you will not leave this universal family, which is not by construction inherited um, by, uh, from the universality of a particular family of RC. Okay, so now um, we have everything we needed. So we have now the results on implicit reduction and kernelization that I spelled out earlier. And it happens to be the case that now the setting is much more advantageous for what I basically provided you with earlier in terms of this implicit reduction and kernelization, right? Now I can work with the infinite dimensional state space, right? So this will be this double tensor algebra. I can also construct for you the explicit um, analytical representation of my. Uh, functional, which is associated to that state map uh, of that recursion that you see, saw before. And now what I can do, I can use that kernel to basically induce my RKHS, right? And I can now um, use my representative theorem and construct my solution of a penalized uh, ERM problem as simply a linear combination of my basically images of my kernel functions, right? Um, uh, as many as I have data points in my sample. So I will con I, I can construct my, my solution in the span of the data. 
Okay, how can we do that? So before I do that, I told you that there was one more thing that we were requiring from kernel, which will be very handy. I would like also to keep the, this recursive nature also for kernels. So if I'm working with this uh, infinite uh, um, sequences as my inputs, um, can I also say something about the fact how can I compute my kernel um, for my ZZ prime as a function of a, a image of the kernel for the uh, delayed sequences or time shifted Z and Z prime sequences by, by, by one step in time. And indeed, it, it happens to be the case that you can actually come up with a recursion also for kernels. So without having the need to compute these inner products that I showed you, right? Computing the functionals and looking at their images and constructing the inner product, which of course will be, <laughs> we are in the infinite dimensional setting, um, we can already compute a kernel and get it in our hands. So initializing this kernel with some initial value, actually these recursions do not depend on the initialization of your kernel, we can compute each uh, Volterra kernel on Z, Z prime as basically this function that you see here, where we are looking at the basically the inner product of the zero uh, elements in my Z and Z prime um, sequences. Um, and this tau and lambda are the same tau and lambda hyperparameters that you saw before, satisfying these um, concrete conditions. And you can see that now my kernel is nothing else as a linear function of my previous kernel or kernel, um, which is evaluated on the time shifted one step um, back uh, infinite sequences Z and Z prime. And also this linear recursion also has um, an explicit solution. So actually I can write down the closed form solution for my kernel. And now whatever Z is the prime you are giving me, I can give you an expression of my kernel. You may say, okay, this infinite sum may be a problem because we're still working with this infinite left infinite sequences as Z and Z prime. But I remind you that when we were applying it and looking through the prism of represent the theorem um, applied to a concrete application on the training data, we were usually, usually working with these truncated sequences. And here is the same trick as which we will be playing. So I will be again working with my truncated sequences. They will be N long, which are obtained via, well, the, the N of them will be obtained via setting up to zero all the elements up to minus infinity and keeping only the elements from I to minus N plus one, um, which are filled in by true input entries and all the others, as I said, are zeros. So with that setting, clearly we don't need to compute our Gramian for the zeros. So what I can do, I can just construct the Gram matrix, which will be a matrix of N dimension, where N is the length of my sample, right, which I'm given. And I will be computing it as follows. For every IJ element in my Gramian, Volterra Gramian, I will be obtaining it as looking at the basically evaluation of my kernel on these two truncated sequences where I and J, well, uh, those I and J um, as the indices of the element that I'm trying to compute. Okay, and again, what I could do with this setting, I could recast my recursion for infinite sequences into a recursion that I really can compute for a particular N long training data. And how would I do it? I will just initialize my zero, zero, uh, let's say, or one, one, if you want, depending on where this, I, my initial value, right? Which doesn't enter the Gramian with some one divided by one minus lambda squared. Again, it doesn't depend on your initialization. Um, but for example, for this kind of a choice, I could then set up a recursion, which now pay attention to the fact that now it runs from one up to N. So I will be filling in the lower triangular part of my Gramian according to this recursion. So each time my new entry IJ will be a function of my entry in the previous row and in my previous column of my Gramian. And this will be nothing else but the inner product of my truncated, uh, of my entries in my inputs, right? So this will be just, if you want, 
uh, uh, just the sum of uh, uh, the products of my of my inputs, right? So now with that uh, in place, what will be very nice is that now I can just fill in the lower triangular part of my gramian by symmetry. I will complete the upper triangular part of my gramian, and now I can go ahead. Putting it to work, now it's totally explicitly computable for my training data, ready to go. And now I can use it for my uh, learning tasks. So in particular, what I can do is my, as I said, by representing the theorem, my linear readout, W that I'm trying to find, will be a linear combination of uh, basically uh, my kernel functions, right? Or my images of my Volterra uh, functional uh, on this truncated sample that I introduced earlier. So who are those alphas and how we're supposed to choose them? And again, we're coming back to the same idea that we will be using this um, basically formulation of an optimization problem depending on the choice of a loss function and a learning task in question. Let me show you what we can do for forecasting. Let me mention here before I do that, um, one important advantage of having this kind of a recursion. If you're looking at this inner product of these elements in my inputs, so indexed by n minus j and minus, uh, minus i, you will see that what I could possibly do, I could use this recursion in order to construct the forecast of my input for the next time step, and then use it in order to get my next value of my kernel. And this way I could pass continue. So I could construct iterative forecasts if I want, unlike what you can unfortunately do with uh, sequential kernels, you need to recompute kernel from scratch whenever a new data point comes in and you will be not able to pass continue uh, because you don't have this iterative way to update your kernel values for new data points arriving or construct it as a forecast. So let me show you how this goes. Let me give you input z's. I'm interested in obtaining the forecast of the outputs up to h steps into the future, right? And uh, well now, um, what I will be doing, I will be just uh, constructing what I told you. I will be constructing the linear combination um, of basically uh, my kernel evaluations on my truncated samples. And now what I will be doing, I will be constructing my, sorry, new forecast as basically um, the projection of my uh, Volterra kernel, um, which I updated with the J's uh, a forecasted point at a time. And this way I could continue up to H. So I estimated my Gremian on N points in the training, but then I can continue up to H. Each time I will be getting a new forecast of my input, Y or Z, I will be plugging it into the kernel computation here. Instead of the Z, I will be evaluating my K Volterra head and I will be plugging it again and again. And this way I can construct iterative forecasts of my time series. So this is something that is not available for existing kernels. And let us see if this works because the only kernels that we know are the uh, signature kernels, um, PD kernels for sequential data. There is GUC kernel and we obviously can co compare it to the static kernels, for example, to a Gaussian one. Let me finalize with this numerical illustration. So we took this example from Salvi Lyons uh, paper, which is cited in our um, result. And uh, well, perhaps here I did not update. I don't remember if this number is what uh, actually entered uh, the archive uh, available paper. Maybe this is this number is slightly different. I don't have it on top of my mind, but the difference is uh, quite large with the existing kernels. So what we're doing here. We're taking Bitcoin price. Again, this is an example in their paper. We just took their code. Uh, we took their implementation of RBF, GAC kernel, signature with truncation up to order N, um, signature PD kernel, which is proposed in their paper. And if you want these results up to this part, up to reservoir kernel is something that is published in their paper. So we took their data and the task was the following. Uh, we are taking each time 36 days of Bitcoin prices, and we're trying to forecast an average of the two future days of a price. And this way you're proceeding, right? Here you can see with a gray color what is um, reserved for the testing. What is not in gray and is white is uh, reserved for training. So the kernel evaluation for them 
or estimation, right? Uh, stops here. They're taking those alphas that they got from their optimization by representer. And then they're using them in order to obtain all these future values. And they show that the mean average percentage error, so this is in percentage for these kernels is what you see over here. Um, what we produced, again, I'm not sure this is exactly the number, but it was two point something. So it is much lower than what is available in the literature. Again, we mimicked the implementation. So it's exactly the same data, exactly the same example. So here I would like to conclude with that with a couple of, let's say, bullet points um, that I did not put on the slide. Uh, I have just thank you, but I would like just to mention that what we did is first, we got this idea that there is this uh, hanging in the air and with Boumediene, with you, we discussed and with people um, who are usually participating in this seminar series, we had uh, this thing was in the air that this state map that is randomly generated or its ingredients is randomly sampled out of some law seems like a random feature map that you have in, uh, in kernel trick. So how to recast it in such a way that these dynamical features of the state space representation are preserved? We did not have a clue. And it's only in this paper that we finally managed to get it using what we have done on this truncated Volterra representation earlier. We just decided not to truncate anymore, keeping things infinite dimensional in terms of the state uh, space. We were managing actually to compute or to get the recursions uh, for our states, right, that live in that uh, infinite dimensional space, we could write down explicitly filter and a functional, which is associated to that state map. And moreover, we could even compute the kernel using recursions, which as you could see for finite samples could be obtained as using this truncated sample proxy that we uh, came up with. And then, well, you can get your alphas uh, out of uh, basically solving your finite dimensional um, optimization problem. And uh, you can conclude uh, your basic task with that. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Any questions or comments? There is Manjunath, <laughs> but yeah. uh, a direct message, <laughs> yeah. not a question. Uh, uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I just have a question. Uh, you're talking about the span of the reachable sets. Mm -hmm. um, can you say something of when the span is actually invariant under your functional? Do you get something or is there something that you can? When I mean, you're talking invariant under functional, so you see these reachable sets is something that we mainly used in this uh, implicit reduction, which we're not using much in this kernelization, right? So if you want, this was just to um, uh, make a point that already in the finite dimensional case, you can gain something out of uh, writing things down using this span of reachable states. So when you're talking about invariance, um, you're, you're talking about under which functional, under the state functional, under uh, under Volterra functional? Uh, under, under the state functional. Under the state functional. Mm. That's actually a very good question. Because what we did in that paper, we were doing for a given uh, state map, right? An associated uh, functional, we are designing this span of reachable sets. But uh, characterizing a family of uh, functionals, right? Or let's say state maps, uh, these functionals associated to it, under which this um, span will be invariant, um, yeah, I would not be able to tell you right from the top of my head. All right, no issues. Okay then, uh, thank you very much again. Thank you, other questions or comments? That's impossible. There's a lot of stuff. <laughs> Well, Boumediene, I'm expecting questions from you. You're an expert on RKHS and... Uh, and yeah, I think I, I, yeah, I invited you, but I need to digest because I'm definitely very interested in this, but yeah, I think I need to digest. Uh...
things and then uh, yeah probably better to have like a one-on-one -on -one meeting yeah no but we once had this discussion about the fact that we want this uh, online update for the kernel right yes, uh, yes. and uh, this was something that we never could get so of course you can take your let's say observations of a dynamical system or time series and long right and then you you basically put your static kernel on it right and then the way and then you can use different criteria so you were using this lapun of exponents right to see the stability of your kernel under uh, using all these uh, papers with Oman, right? Uh, with this cross validation, uh, if you take a half of the data, how stable you are with respect to this chunk, right? And things like that. But the, we did, we could not find a way in which we could write down recursions for our kernel. And it's only now with this result that we could. And then what you could do, you can just reevaluate your kernel and hence construct the not direct forecasts, right? But you can just keep going and construct iterative ones if you are interested. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, I mean, this is what I was, uh, yeah, because I was wondering what's the link, I mean, with the, the online, with the recursive formula, how it could be adapted. Yeah, so we had like this uh, comment about using the Newton basis where you, uh, yeah, you wouldn't have to evaluate uh, everything, you just have like to, to update your uh, coefficient in the representative theorem, but but this recursive formula is definitely interesting. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so I, I think I need to digest more <laughs> this time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I had, as, as you know, I've been trying to to link the two, but so it's nice that you did it. Actually, the reservoir computing and intuitively it seems uh, yeah, it seems intuitive that uh, the the two. Okay. Are, are related, especially given the representative theorem. So they, they just seem to have a, a similar representation, that like linear readout versus linear combination of the feature maps. They just sounded uh, yeah, like a low hanging fruit. So yeah, so you got it. <laughs> yeah, well, we will still need to do a lot of work in exploring, right? What this can do in applications and in which cases this makes sense to use it, right? Yeah. And then of course, ill-conditioned um, gram is still there, right, Gramian? So um, yeah. you see, we are, we are, this is more on the disadvantages, if you want, right, just to warn people maybe in the audience, right, that when we're computing this, obviously, uh, our next, uh, basically, kernel entry, uh, or Gramian entry is a linear function of the previous one. So clearly, this will be uh, you know, very much dependent columns and rows in the Gramian, right? So when you're trying to basically invert that, right, then you are getting into troubles. So you need to regularize as usual, right? So you have basically the whole usual story that we are having when we are trying to invert um, the covariance matrix, right, which is ill-conditioned. So yeah. the same thing happens here. So the way to go about that perhaps will be not to invert the Gramian, but to use stochastic gradient descent where you don't need to invert. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Pietro, did you have a question or? No, no, no. I think I need, I need to spend more time on this before being able to ask a question, but. Yeah. The, the, the tensors are blowing us apart. So we should have a slide for dummies like us. So what, what, what are you saying? What? Yeah, the tensors and all these are blowing us apart. So you should have us, you should have some slides, you know, which show things for dummies like us, so where you can show the implementation. Yeah, well, you see, the thing is that you never actually compute those guys, right? So uh, Basically, this is just to tell you where the states leave, right? But when you are basically writing things down, you never see them. So that's the point, right? So you just use them, these states up there, right? So that you can write down explicitly your filter, um, functional, and then to write down kernel. And as usual in kernel trick, you don't need to compute the inner product of these images of right. your feature map, right? But you just, right. if you happen to be able to compute it, uh, basically already in the in the original space right so basically in reals right this is this recursion is just on reals right even mm -hmm. though this uh, basically has to do something with this infinite dimensional representation up there but uh, you never compute it so with truncated for example results we had troubles right because there in order to get this truncated uh, tensor representation you need to keep a track of these lx to the past p 
orders or for the monomial and you need to keep a track of that and there was no way you can actually compute things without by hand working with those guys right so then we came up with this random projection not to do that right so this thing okay. truncated is already large dimensional then you randomly project and you're in smaller dimensional thing where you can do things but in the computer or i mean there is no way that you can ever run this state equation right so right. So it just uh, that we appropriately chose this tensor algebra structure so that you basically can do things. And we just recycled what we had for truncated version, but just uh, not going in this uh, direct uh, sums and products up to some finite you know, L or P, right? But just letting it go to infinity and taking all the orders of monomials and all the time lags. Right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot for joining. And uh, sorry that it was a little bit longer than one hour, but uh, I think that it's quite general, quite quite usual, right, for this series. Yeah, yeah. But this is like my, for the format here, is that yeah, that there's no and, time limit. So I just want people to feel comfortable talking. You know. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, and actually, that's great that we're losing this habit of online talks. I realize that it's been a while. So last talks that I gave were mainly already in person. So I realized that, uh, you know, for the purpose of uniting people from different places when you cannot bring them all together, right? That's a great series to continue. Yeah. Because, uh, yeah, it's only the two hemispheres that are difficult to make uh, coincide, right, in terms of the time zone. But I yeah. think that at least Europe, US. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we try I mean, one time to have like an early, like a Singapore, this kind of things. But yeah, so just. Yeah, but usually you, you lose people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Thank you, Bumidian, yeah, for inviting again. me. Yeah, Thank you. Everyone. Thanks a lot, everybody who joined. Mm. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Pietro. Bye, Manjunath. Bye, everyone.